Okay, everybody. Thank y'all for being here. I really appreciate y'all braving the weather and getting out. I don't know about y'all, but I was really ready to get out of my house. So thank you all for coming. I am very excited to introduce this uh, group of guest speakers. Um, we have a, a group of folks from Institute for Applied Ecology to talk to us about their incredible program, Rearing Endangered Butterflies in Area Prisons. And uh, before we get started, I would like to thank a couple of people. First of all, I would like to thank Jacob and Common Fields for hosting us. They have us every month. We really appreciate them. They set all this stuff up for us, all the, the screens and AV equipment. It's great. So thank you, Jacob, and everybody here. Um, I'd also like to thank Thomas in the back with the camera. <laughs> who is volunteering his time to make this video and so we can make it available to folks. So if any of you have people who were not able to be here, if you'd like to sign up in the back, we can make sure that we send the link to the video to you when it's ready. Um, and we would like to thank Oregon Conservation and Recreation Fund for funding this series as well. So. First up is Dr. Karen Hall. Uh, Karen is the program director for the Ecological Education Program at Institute for Applied Ecology and manages all aspects of that uh, pretty diverse program offerings um, and has been a lifelong naturalist, passionate about helping people connect with nature. Thank you very much for being here and for bringing your team. Thank you, Nina, for inviting us. We really appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out tonight on such a night. It's just really great to see everybody in smiling faces and uh, in this uh, weather. Okay. All right. You abandoned me. It's all right. <laughs> Um, my name is Karen Hall, and I'm the program director for the Ecological Education Program at IAE. And with me today are three, actually a little over a quarter of the total teammates that we have here at IAE. And um, you'll meet them a little bit later, but I'll give you their names now, which is Ari Saliba, Annie Lamas, and Frederick Livingston. And today we're here really to talk about the work that we do with butterflies, particularly endangered species. Uh, and we do that in the context of prisons, so our title being Metamorphosis in Prisons and how that can change people and butterflies. All right, so this is the entire team of the Echo Ed program at IAE. Uh, nine people, and the thing I want you to pay attention to is the states where people are located. So we have a lot of remote workers. We work in Oregon, Eastern Oregon, Wyoming, Idaho, and Nevada. And you'll see a few of uh, familiar faces today on the screen. I don't particularly care that you read this, but I really wanted you to sort of see the breadth of our work. We work primarily with plants, that's true. We do have butterfly programs too, but we work primarily with plants. We work in the states that I mentioned, and you can just sort of see that as you go down, and a lot of work with sagebrush. You'll hear a little bit about that as well. Okay. So I wanna to talk to you first about butterflies in prison and what's coming up uh, right now in the talk. I'm gonna turn this over uh, to our team, my teammates, because they really do the work. We have uh, two captive rearing programs that we work with, one that we're in charge of. And so the first one is the Taylor's Checkerspot Butterfly Program. That actually takes place at uh, Coffee Creek Correctional Facility in Wilsonville, so not too far up the road from here. Not only do we have a captive rearing lab inside the medium facility, but we also have host plants that we grow inside that facility as well. In the minimum facility at Coffee Creek, we raise uh, host plants for Oregon Silver Spot, and we don't have that captive rearing program that's done by the Oregon Zoo, but we're providing them plant material nonetheless. We also do work with Oregon State Correctional Institute uh, to provide uh, host plant seed production for Fender's Blue Butterfly, so we're growing Kincaid's Lupin and some other plants. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you about a little bit about some of our partners. Um, chief among them is really the Departments of Correction. None of this work would be possible if we didn't really have good and close connections with uh, corrections officers. And it sounds funny, when you start, first start working in prisons, you know, you have all the stereotypes of corrections officers in your head. And you come to find out that some of them are actually really great people. <laughs> and they really do care about the environment. And they'll work with you to really make a big difference with not only the crews, but also the butterflies. And so we've been fortunate enough to find folks like that in DOC. 
Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has been a big, strong funding partner for us, but they're also a knowledge partner. So we're sharing knowledge across uh, what we learn, what they learn, so that we can get better at captive rearing and knowing how captive rearing also impacts the, uh, the animals that are released, what happens once they're released. Uh, Benton County Soil and Water Conservation District has also helped us with a few things. And at the bottom, I'm sorry, the logos you can't see are the Oregon Zoo. Of course, they're a partner with the Silver Spot. Um, and in the corner, what you really can't see is the Sa Sustainability in Prisons project. Um, our project was inspired by that, and it is a major program in Washington State where all of the prisons in Washington State have sustainability initiatives. And this is a program that is run out of Evergreen University, so it's a partnership between departments of correction and a university, which is really cool. And they do some incredible work, too. So I wanted to mention them because we also share a lot of knowledge between us. So I'm going to turn it over now to Ari. Let her start to talk about, to you about the Tails Checker Spot Butterfly. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Ari. I am uh, kind of the point person for uh, the Taylor's Checker Spot Butterfly Lab that we have at Coffee Creek Correctional Facility. Uh, before I dive too much into it, have any of you ever heard of the Taylor's Checker Spot? Yeah? Cool. Um, it's this butterfly right here. It's really gorgeous. Um, and it is federally endangered, which is why we have this uh, larva rearing lab. Um, and it is at Coffee Creek, as I mentioned, which is a women's facility. Uh, we have about seven lab techs, and they do everything from uh, getting the eggs of this butterfly um, and bringing it into pupation. And in total, this butterfly has about 13 total populations, and that ranges from um, BC, Vancouver, that area, uh, and then into Washington and Oregon. Historically, Corvallis has had some of the most ro uh, robust populations, but um, their populations are decreasing, which is why the work we do is so important. The lab started in 2018, and since then we have raised over 10,000 larvae, which is really cool. Um, one thing about this butterfly as to why its population has been decreasing is mostly due to its host plant decreasing and that's largely due to habitat loss. Um, the host plant was originally harsh paintbrush or Indian paintbrush, which if you haven't seen it, it's this really gorgeous flower. It's kind of red and orange. Um, it's really stunning, but because of habitat loss, that host plant has uh, been disappearing and therefore the butterfly has been uh, losing its populations as well. The really unique thing about this butterfly though is it's actually been able to adapt and it's um, found a new host plant, which is English plantain, which is not a native here, but these butterflies have found a way to utilize it. So the Indian paintbrush and also um, the yellow paintbrush, they've all been drastically declining because they tend to like to grow in open prairies um, and oak savannas. And that habitat in particular has been really heavily impacted um, by urban growth and just uh, human activity. So with that declining, um, habitat, we've been losing a lot of those plants they typically rely on. And they do have a few other host plants, such as sea blush, but it's not as common, uh, which is why they've adapted to the English planting. Yeah, but you, you read that the paintbrush is heavy parasitic, so it like takes the nitrogen from other plants that it lives on, and it can get that from various different plants in the area. Oh, so it doesn't, it's not? It's not as specific. The butterfly is much more specific to the host plant, but then the host plant, it sort of becomes this like stacking doll kind of situation within the host plant requires a different host plant to get its nitrogen. Um, and I think it's sort of just broadly that ecosystem is declining. And that's why we grow plantains. It's much easier to grow a weed than this like delicate native that requires a host plant. Because you can't just grow a paintbrush. You can grow a paintbrush on top of Oregon sunshine or something else. Yeah. Whoops. Um, well, this arranged itself on its own, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, but this is the order. It is cyclical, so, you know, what came first, the butterfly or the egg? Um, but this image here, these are the new eggs. They're very fresh and yellow. And then as they develop, they swell. They turn kind of this reddish color. And then at the end, they turn almost black. And that photo there is the new larva coming out. 
And then after this, they grow and sleep a lot, and they actually molt into what we call instars. They grow and molt and grow and molt. Um, but in between that time, they sleep a lot. Um, I think people tend to think when they wake up, they're super active, and they do eat a lot when they wake up, but they also sleep a lot. So um, they kind of wake up, eat, go back to sleep, and then they continue to grow. Um, and then once they get to be about this size, they'll go into their little, little pupate. Um, and then we have here an enclosed butterfly. So it has uh, come out of its chrysalis. It's a nice butterfly. In this picture in specific, they have it in the lab in a little petri dish type thing. Um, and then the next step in the lab is they will take adult butterflies and then they will put them in an enclosed plantain plant, which um, the one we passed around is an example of what that looks like. They coat it in a type of fabric so that it can't escape. And then they will lay eggs on that plantain. So in that photo, that little yellow bit under the butterfly, that's it laying eggs. Um, you might have noticed that the plant we passed around has rocks on the bottom. Does anyone have any guesses as to why they might put rocks on the bottom of the plant? Um, they do that because the eggs are so tiny and when they're first hatched, they're very soft. And if they were to have it on soil, they wouldn't be able to pick them up as easily. Um, the way these women pick up the eggs is actually with a tiny paintbrush and they paint them off of the leaves. So if they were to do that and they were to fall on soil, it would be really easy for the eggs to get lost. So that's why they um, put rocks on the bottom. So in this slide, um, the photo, what is that to your right? We have a, one of our lab techs and she's looking at some of the eggs under a microscope. And this is really common work that they do in the lab. These women are amazing. Um, they know this species really well. So um, this is part of routine work that they do. And you'll notice to the side of our lab tech, there is a plant that is the English plantain, which is something we grow on site at Coffee Creek. And I'm gonna hand it over to Annie to talk a little bit more about the plantain program. Thank you, Ari. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, what you can see in this photo, um, behind this one actually is what the Plantago yard used to look like. And so inside the medium facility at Coffee Creek, um, the women are growing English plantain right in the ground. Um, so behind this photo, they used to be grown in rows. And I'm sure as most of you know, monoculture doesn't always do very well thanks to pests and other diseases that are uh, susceptible and monocrops usually hit pretty hard and so what we've done this year and what the women have ultimately done is they've redesigned the yard into this kind of keyhole design that you see here. Um, so the purpose behind this was we'd increase the growing area um, and we implemented intercropping into the new growing space to kind of simulate the naturalized environment that Plantago would normally grow in in the wild. Um, as we know it's a weed or a non-native and it's fairly easy to grow. It pops up in our garden. I'm sure some of you notice it in your yard and it's not the most wanted or friendly plant, um, but it's not the most harmful weed either. I know there's some really gnarly ones out there. Um, a plantago growing it as a crop is fairly easy. Um, so what the program looks like on the inside is the women, um, they take care of it. They water the plants, they fertilize the yard, um, and they harvest the leaves. That's their big job throughout the year. So their season starts in about February when the larvae wake up. Um, and so they'll go out into the yard and they'll collect leaves regardless of the condition. Last year, uh, from the growing season, which started in end of February, uh, beginning of March until about July or August, uh, the women collected over 36,000 leaves for the butterflies. Um, so they're, they're some hungry creatures for sure. And um, we have about six women on that crew, um, and they're very dedicated to the program. Um, and like Ari mentioned, um, we grow Plantago because Taylor's Checker Spot has switched its host plant from both types of paintbrushes. There's harsh paintbrush here and then golden paintbrush over there. Um, and the women just have a lot of pride in this program. Um, I meant to go, um, I don't know if I can go back. Oh, yeah, no, I can't go back. Um, but no, there's no way to go back. Um, <laughs> But the women have a lot of pride in the program. Um, they feel very connected to it. Um, a lot of the women, when they talk about getting released, they say they want to go into some kind of gardening program when they get out or have their own garden at home, um, whatever that looks like. And so they really are impacted a lot by the program that we do. Um, and on top of the Plantago program, we also have the Viola program, which I will pass off to Frederick to talk about.
Yes, thank you, Annie. Yes, some of you all touched briefly on the viola program. There's a lot of similarities with the Taylor's Checker Spot Butterfly program, but there's a few maybe key differences. Um, this is for the Oregon Silver Spot, which is another rare butterfly. It's only in a few populations, sort of in the coast range in Oregon. Um, and we grow viola dunca, which is this early blue violet here. Um, we, they harvest the leaves, and then they, unlike in the um, medium facility, they're harvesting the leaves, putting them in containers, and then the Oregon Zoo comes and picks them up because the lab where they're being reared is at the Oregon Zoo. So it's a little bit different, um, but the basic premise is the same. Uh, last year we got over 200 cups of leaves, which maybe doesn't sound like a crazy monumental feat, but um, the leaves are like smaller than dimes, and it takes hours of like bending over these little pots to pick off one leaf at a time and fill them. Um, so it's quite a lot of labor over the course of the season. We're getting ready for it now. Um, usually the season starts in like April or May, depending on the weather. And so we're kind of doing our planning. Right now the plants are sleeping, but very soon we'll you know, get them ready. And you can kind of see, because it's so zoomed up, there's also the seed pods um, is how we collect seeds. And there's some flowers. Um, they're really nice in the spring when they all covered in purple flowers. But let's see, in the, the facility where we actually grow it, is actually outside the secure perimeter because that's in the minimum security. Um, so this is, they walk outside the facility and we have this hoop house here and we've got some raised beds, we grow them. We've got sort of a shade house where we grow them in the spring and summer. And right now they're under like cold frames, like plastic PVC little tents kind of situation. And then on the inside wall here, usually we grow sagebrush during the main season. And I'll talk about that next. Um, the sagebrush program is not for butterflies, but it's still important. It's our biggest program that we do. Um, this is for the greater sage grouse, which is sort of the poster child or the charismatic fauna that we target. But there are, I think, 350 sagebrush obligate species that rely on sagebrush. The grouse relies on sagebrush for like eating the leaves in the spring and like nesting under them in every part of its life cycle. And we grow them at, I think, at yeah, nine different sites in five different states, so kind of all over the West, in areas that generally the sagebrush grow. Um, and Coffee Creek, where we go, where the butterfly program is, we grow like 10,000 sagebrush, which is our smallest program. Some of the sites grow 100,000, so it varies in scale. Um, Coffee Creek, we're focused more on the butterflies, but we need to mention this one too, because it is our largest program in terms of numbers. Um, and in total, we've done like three million plugs from sagebrush and those go out into the landscape into areas that maybe were burned in a wildfire or were converted into agricultural land or a mine that was abandoned and so we're providing the plugs that then get put out with our BLM partners as opposed to the butterfly program where we're feeding the leaf material on site so it's kind of a different cycle um, but it's cool that we can give the crews an opportunity to interact with a lot of different species to make it more interesting um, yeah, and you wanted, and then Annie was going to talk about the beautiful map that she made to show you sort of visual geographic extent. Yeah, so this beautiful map that uh, Frederick mentioned is just kind of a visual so you all can see where our work kind of stretches. And so Karen mentioned in the beginning, we have folks in Nevada, Idaho, Wyoming, uh, one site in California, and then in Oregon. And so the map here that you're seeing shows the historic and the current range of greater sage grouse. And the darker brownish color that you see in the back is the historic greater sage grouse range. And the yellowish orange color is the current range. And from what you can see, um, its range has shrunken by about half and so it's really important the work that we do to uh, restore the land that the greater sage grouse needs like Frederick said it's a sagebrush obligate species and so targeting sagebrush in these areas is really important to restore the land and improve the species and like Frederick said here's the numbers for the year, the program started in 2014, and we started with 20,000 sagebrush, but we fluctuated in numbers somewhere between 300 to 500,000 plugs are grown per year to reach our grand total thus far of over 3.4 million sagebrush. Um, and so we want to highlight one more uh, element of our ecological education program by talking about 
Oh, we're going into, yeah, you did. <laughs> so Karen's going to talk about some of our success stories. <laughs> yep. I always have to put a kicker in there. So um, this year we were really lucky. We got called by a lot of national press folks for work. So we've got a really interesting video that's coming, that is already out, that was done by Wyoming NPR. And it wasn't just a one-shot video. Actually, they came for an entire season. So they filmed the entire process from uh, adults in custody are out collecting seeds, sowing the seeds, growing the seeds, boxing the seeds, and then planting the plants out. It took a whole year for all that to happen, but it's a really wonderful video. Uh, we were on you know, Climate Collections and also uh, the Weather Channel, which was a real uh, fun surprise, uh, and a couple others. And I just wanted to highlight that. A local press we get somewhat regularly because we do a lot of local things. Uh, this is just an article from Lakeview where we did a project uh, growing sagebrush not only with uh, the adults in custody in the Warner Creek prison, but we also, the students in high school in Lakeview grew plants as well. They also went to plant out, and then the, the adults in custody planted out, not at the same time, obviously, but they all worked together on some private landscape to really uh, replenish the sagebrush that had actually burned uh, on that area. And so we'll talk about juvenile detention work next. All right. Um, another really cool program we do uh, is youth education at juvenile centers. So we currently uh, visit two different sites, which are Marion County Juvenile Center and also Lynn Benton Juvenile Center. Um, and we go here every other week. And this work we do, we find really valuable because for a lot of these students, it's their first time having a nature connection. Um, and they haven't necessarily been successful at traditional schooling. So by providing them alternative education that really focuses on the environment, um, we see a lot of excitement from them and a lot of curiosity stem from our lessons. Some examples are um, climate change, animal adaptation, soil ID, uh, botany, silent flyers, skulls and skins, plate tectonics, Cascadia bingo. We do all sorts of fun lessons and we try to switch it up pretty often. And we usually leave having kids tell us that uh, it's their favorite thing they've experienced in a long time or um, that they just wanna keep learning more. So that feels really amazing and uh, we love doing this kind of work. In this photo, you'll see Annie doing some birding at Lynn Benton. Um, and then in the corner here, we have a Mason Bee Hotel that the students got to make. Yeah, and so, yeah, to sort of build off that, I wanted to talk about other opportunities that our program creates. So these are some photos from uh, various women from the Viola crew at Coffee Creek. And I think when people think about conservation, the next word isn't always prisons that comes to mind. It's not the most obvious connection for a lot of people. And it is a fairly unique space that we work in. There's not that many other programs that are doing this kind of work. Um, but it, like, I did not go into it with a lot of prison experience, but then learned the connection through the work that I've been doing. And really, there's, I, I have not found a group of people that is as deprived for their connection of nature as incarcerated people, because they have no ability to go and you know, access nature on their own volition. And so we sort of bring that in to people. And like, as an educator, I found them to be some of the most like, engaged, curious, sort of thirsty for information audiences that I've worked with, which has been really cool and like, really satisfying to see. Um, and some of the experience that we've been able to like, bring about. On the left side, um, these are two women that were doing an outplanting. So we grow plants mostly in pots, but we sometimes grow in little cones here. And then we can bring them out to places like Mount Hebo or to other locations where the Oregon silver spot lives. And then they actually get to plant them in the ground um, and do like active restoration. And the other one is from the Oregon Zoo inside the butterfly lab where the Oregon silver spot larvae are reared. And so they, the women who grow the plants are able to then go into the zoo. It's like they, they shut down every few days in the winter. So it was like a sort of empty space and they were able to get a private tour of the zoo. Um, and then go see the lab where their, because their leaves just sort of disappear. And so it's nice to see where the, where the leaves go, what the, what the actual situation looks like, where the, um, the larvae are being grown. And so there's a lot of cool connections. Um, this is one photo that I took uh, last fall, I guess in October. We got to go to Mount Hebo and do a planting event um, out there. And this was our lunch break. We got to look over the, um, you know, off the, into the coast range. Uh, one of the women, when she got there was like a little bit shaky and a little bit uh, queasy and she told me that was the first time she had been in a car in 25 years. 
um, because she had been incarcerated. And she said that was like one of the highlights of her whole time being there. And that, you know, this is a completely different experience as maybe you can imagine um, as being inside a space where your only access to nature is like a maybe, you know, 5,000 square foot yard, um, you know, which sometimes has grass and it sometimes has gravel, you know, it kind of depends. Um, so it's a cool way to really bring these kind of experiences to people who like have the least access whatsoever. Yeah, and so yeah, these are just a sampling of them. We get a bunch of feedback like this, but um, consistently people talk about it being sort of a refuge or a sanctuary that is created within the prison environment that is um, unfortunately not what the dominant experience is often. And so it's cool to be able to pair the ecological need with the sort of human need as well in a very, I, know, I think a very um, symbiotic way. Yeah. But now I think the next thing, Karen wanted to close this out. Well, thank you all for coming today. I I really uh, forgot to say at the very start to just interject and ask some questions. But we're here at the end, and I think uh, I, what I'd like to do is is wrap up and then and then give you all plenty of time to ask questions. Um, my team right here knows a lot, a lot more than I do about the work because they're doing it every day. Where I'm just looking at grants and and money, and so um, I want them to really speak more than me. Uh, but I do want to say how important the work is and how difficult it can be to get it funded, uh, which is one reason why we do talks like this, uh, not to beg people for money, but to say, please join us. If this work is meaningful to you, please join us in helping to fundraise for it. There are things that you can't normally get funded with uh, state and federal level grants, and that's, that, is one of the, that is one of the things that we do is we fund this work primarily through federal and state agencies. And those are things like um, uh, a ceremony where we provide food um, to celebrate their work for an entire season. Um, people don't want to pay for food on federal and state dollars, and I understand why. Um, but it's also really important. It's a time for crews to come together. I remember the first one that I attended, we brought in hummus in little packs, and people had never seen hummus before, had never heard of hummus. So it was the first time they'd tried it. Um, we brought in fruit juice drinks, the little, um, what are they called, nature drinks or, or naked drinks, naked juices, yeah. Naked juices, they were absolutely enamored with naked juices. They were, they were trading them back and forth the whole day that we were there. It was an opportunity for them to come up and tell us about what they got out of the program and for us to learn from them maybe how we can tweak what we're doing to, to be of better service for them. And so they're always really wonderful celebrations. We usually bring in guest speakers to talk in detail about the ecology of uh, uh, the butterfly or the habitat itself. Um, as you can see, you know, our expertise is really in the prison side of things and in the education side of things. And that's a little bit of a different thing. Um, we know the ecology too, but not as in-depth as a person who's practicing ecology. And so it's always great for them to hear from somebody who's out in the field and, and working uh, directly with the, the individuals, whether that's a butterfly or a plant. Um, because our expertise is more trauma-informed teaching. You know, how can, how can we organize our lessons so that they get the maximum value from them? Um, and also working in prisons, which is an entire thing itself. I, I can't say enough how different it is to work in prisons. I've worked with a lot of different audiences in my career, uh, from adults to kiddos, and prisons are just a, totally another beast. Um, we have to, before we go in, every time we have to send emails and say, this is exactly what I'm bringing. And very often the answer is, you can't bring that. Uh, and it's silly things. We wanted one year to bring in paper so that we could fold up origami trees, uh, right? And they wouldn't allow that. Now they will allow us to bring in paper lessons, but not paper for origami trees. So some of these things are really uh, inexplicable and we don't understand the reasons and the safety, safety protocols that they have in place, we just have to trust them and follow them. Um, but it's just a real different environment and you have to adapt uh, continually. Uh, you might show up and your crew is not there. And so you might end up waiting an hour for their crew because the prison scheduled something and didn't let you know. So it's just a really challenging environment. But I don't think there's a single staff member that I have that doesn't really believe in the work and really find it super fulfilling. So I'm really proud to be leading such a team, uh, find myself in that position. So thank you for listening to us tonight. But why don't you guys join me? So I feel sure everybody has questions.
Um, so a lot of the women um, have to go through a formal application process, just like they're applying for a regular job in the real world. Um, and so we actually held some interviews for a couple more butterfly technicians uh, just last week, I believe. And they had to submit a 400 word essay about why they want to be in the program and what it would mean to them. Um, we asked them a set of interview questions such as, what do you hope to gain? Do you have any relevant work experience? Do you have any questions for us? Um, what's your learning style? Things like that. Um, and they sat down and interviewed with us for 20 minutes. And I have to say the caliber of interview that we got was unreal. A lot of the women were super passionate about the work. They were very interested in being part of the program. And they not only saw you know, the need for the job, but they also saw the need for more of these animals in the wild and why we're doing the work that we're doing to not only support endangered species, um, but to increase their populations in the wild as well. Yeah, no, they, they are separate. Um, partly because of just the physical infrastructure of the prison. Like you can't move from medium security to minimum, um, but you can go up security. So for like a celebration, we can bring them all together. Um, but generally they're in their own departments and they're kind of chosen based on their skill set and interest because the butterfly lab is a different sort of activity, um, different skill set than like working in the yard. Do you have any plans to start growing the kinkades with them? And, and I think, I can't remember what that slide at the beginning said, but there was some trouble involving the tenders and kinkades. Yeah, yeah we, we, we do currently grow Kincaid's lupin at Oregon State Correctional Institution, which is a men's facility in Salem. Um, but it's a good example of how like, the contact of the prison is such a key part of our success because we had people there who were like really into it, a champion, like totally got what we were doing. And then if that person gets transferred, you have to kind of re-pitch it and explain why you're there all over again. And so we're kind of in, at this moment, we're in that process of trying to get back in. So the plants are still in the ground, they're still harvesting seeds, but we're not as involved as we are with Coffee Creek, just based on our contacts. And that fluctuates from year to year in different sites that suddenly are able or not, or anything like that, you know. Yeah. Um, why are you growing the plantago? be set and not like the native species if you're planting it versus just like having it. Well, you answered that a little earlier. So okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, partly it's just a practicality. Uh, English plantain is much easier to grow than the paintbrush because uh, the paintbrush is hemiparasitic, so it needs a host plant to parasitize. And so you have to be growing that on top of it. And we do grow paintbrush at OSCI, I believe. I'm not sure if it's currently active, but we have grown it there. Um, but just in terms of like getting bulk leaf material, it's much more practical to grow the plantain because it, it volunteers itself, basically. Yep. I will say one of the reasons that we are doing the design that Annie, Annie uh, talked about a little bit earlier is because we had a major crash of Plantago last year. It came up, it was beautiful. The, lar the yard, according to everybody who saw it, said they, they thought it looked the best they'd ever seen it look. And then uh, by about June, it started to really decline. And by the time July got there, we were just really panicking. And we started harvesting indigo around the, around the hoop house and pretty much anywhere we could find it. And so that was what caused the redesign. And I just wanted to emphasize that even weeds can crash. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I used to run the Master Gardener program for South Carolina, so I love them. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I had a um, question about uh, the butterflies host plant preference. Um, I was curious, uh, is there any research on like if you have both plantago and uh, paintbrushes available? Do they still prefer paintbrush, or are they? Uh, 
Yeah, I don't know about any specific research in that vein, but what I can tell you is that the butterflies are actually after iridoid glycosides. It's a secondary metabolite that, that, that many plants produce, not all plants, but many plants produce. And it just so happens it's present in plantago too. So, and that's probably why it's an alternative host plant is because it's present there. There is some research I think that shows that um, they will preferentially not choose plants with high levels of, uh, so if it doesn't have a high level of iridoid glycosides, they're not gonna choose it. But specific ends of it, I'm not sure of it. We don't do any of that. Um, that's done for us by U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And so what happens at uh, pretty much in another month or so, we're going to be calling Fish and Wildlife, and they're going to be asking us, well, are the butterflies waking up? And when the butterflies start to demonstrate that they are waking up, then they make plans to put them in places perhaps like Green Hill um, um, or Bald Hill. Um, and so... Um, that's sort of the first step. The second step is when the adult females are actually out and flying, they'll assess the size of the population and then they'll base how many females they pull based on those assessments and they'll bring those butterflies to us. So we don't really see any of that activity, although we do hope uh, at some point in the future to be getting some crews out there uh, to see some butterflies. So. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. You've been a great audience for us today, and thank you so much. Thank you all again. That was so moving and just really incredible. Thank you for being here and for the program. Uh, and thank all of you for coming. Um, thank you again to Jacob and Common Fields. And anybody's interested we will be back here next month on the 15th for james cassidy to learn all about soil if you haven't heard james speak you need to be here <laughs> so thank you guys